In this presentation, we are going to look at applications of all that we have learned. The applications use all of our previous results to some extent. So basically, what can we do? We can find the electric field in three different ways, either by a direct summation integration or superposition. We can use Gauss's law when we have a symmetrical situation. And we can find the electric field by taking the negative gradient of the potential. In the case of the potential, we can also find it in three different ways. We can use direct integration. We can employ a line integral to calculate the total work we do against the force field per charge, the electric field. And we can also solve a differential equation, but we haven't done this yet. In the electrical engineering course 261 and the math associated course 264, seamlessly integrated, we have learned a number of new math tools. What have we learned so far? We've learned how to do surface integrals of dot products of fields and surface area patches. That's related to Gauss's law. We've learned how to do line integrals of dot products of fields and differential line elements. That allows us to compute the potential energy associated with an electric field. We can do volume integrals to compute charges from density distributions. We can apply the gradient to get the electric field from the potential. And we can find the divergence of the electric flux density to get the volumetric charge density. And we have all the previous tools of integration, differentiation, chain rule, dot product, vector manipulations at our disposal. Now, in the next number of slides, we're going to apply some of the to these tools directly to some very basic problems, which have some very important applications. The first application, denoted by A1 in blue, is to calculate and look at the behavior of the electric field across a boundary between two materials with different dielectric constants. So the first thing we'll do is we'll set up the boundary situation. We'll choose the physics that we need. We'll do the math, in this case, line integrals. We'll look at the final result. And then we'll have technique practice, potential calculations using line integrals. In this slide, we see that we have an interface indicated by the red line, and we have Epsilon 1, the material in the first part of the um, object we're studying. And we also have Epsilon 2, which is in the bottom right here. So this red line separates the two materials. We have an electric field that is separated into two components, uh, one that's tangential and one that's normal. And we also have the same in the bottom part here, E2, also separated in tangential and normal components. And our goal in this is to study the behavior of the electric field components as we cross the boundary. All right, in this slide, we have to figure out how to constrain the components of E across that boundary. So what do we know? Well, we know the following, that the line integral around a closed loop has got to be equal to zero because there's no friction and we have a conservative field. So we're going to use that in the next slide to find out how to constrain our electric field components. And we're going to use a little trick because that contour that we see, the contour C starting at A and coming back to A, is not a very nice contour. Let's see how we can simplify all this in the next slide. All right, we're still choosing the physics that we need. And here we have again our closed contour, but let's pick a better contour. Let's pick a contour that allows us to do the integral very simply. So what we want to do is pick this contour for our potential integral that starts at the top, as we see here, the red arrow crosses with the black arrow, goes back on the red and up, 
and we assume that the sides of this little contour are vanishingly small, so we just have to do the integral along the top and the bottom of this little blue rectangle. The sides don't contribute, and the question is, do we actually have to do an integral? Because in this case, our contour is just a single little element of length. So we physically don't have to do an integral, and that's good news for us. All right, here we have our little contour. There is no integral to do. We just have to evaluate some dot products. So let's do that. Here we go. And here we can see what we have to do. We have to take e dot dl all around this contour. It's equal to 0. Now there's no contributions from the black arrows corresponding to going around the contour because they're vanishingly small. So all we have are the dot products associated with going across the top and the bottom. So here E1 dot DL1 is going on the top in material E1 and E2 dot DL2 is, going, is coming back. And you can see that DL2 is in the negative direction. So that means that we can just substitute in for E1 and E2 and then do the dot product. T hat dot T hat is 1 and N hat dot T hat is equal to 0. So that means that these terms here, the N terms disappear and all we're left with is E1T minus E2T DL is equal to 0. So what conclusion can we draw about the components of E? Well, I think it's pretty obvious from the algebra of the previous slides by doing the contour integral and reducing it to that little integral along the boundary, picking up the tangential components that we have, that the tangential components of the electric field are continuous across the boundary interface. And that's a very important result that will be used in many different applications, including reflection and refraction and studying electromagnetic waves propagating across boundaries between different materials. Now we're going to study the second application. The second application consists of looking at the electric flux density across a boundary. As before, we will follow the same procedure. We set up the boundary situation. We choose the physics we need. We do the math. In this case, it's going to be a surface integral related to Gauss's theorem, Gauss's law, and electrostatics. We look at the final result. And of course, on the way, we'll get lots of technical practice. Well, here we go again. We're setting up the boundary situation. And we need to know how to set things up in a nice way. Well, before. We were interested in the tangential components at the end, but we start the same way. We resolve the electric flux density. As you can see in the figure, it has a tangential component and it has a normal component for both material, uh, the electric flux density in material epsilon 1 and also similar in epsilon 2. And what we're going to see this time, since we're going to see, use Gauss's law, is it's going to be the normal components that will come into play. In this slide, we can see that we've introduced a pillbox for a Gaussian surface, and we're going to compute the electric flux density fields through the surface of this pillbox. And the way we pick the pillbox is that the sides are going to be very small, so all the flux is going to come out of the gray top and bottom. So therefore, we're just going to have to take a dot product with S1, DS1, and D1, and DS2 and D2, just making sure of the signs of the area elements. And then we will see what happens and what constraints we get on our components of D. In this case, there is no contained charge. So that means the net flux coming out of only the top and bottom gray faces of our little pillbox here and here are going to contribute and their sum will be equal to zero. 
All right. What do we see in this slide? Well, we see we don't have to do any integrations. We have a small pillbox, so we just compute the flux from the top and the bottom. And we can see that from the equations, if you look at them, we just have d1 dot ds1 from the top here, d2 dot ds2 equals 0. We substitute into the form of the d's and take the dot products. And look at the third equation. Because t dot n hat, t hat dot n hat is equal to 0, we just are left with the normal components dotted n hat dot n hat. And so we just see that we have d1n and d2n here with the sign coming from the fact that the outward normal below is pointing down. So what do we know then about the normal components? Well, from the previous slide, it's obvious since d1n minus d2n is equal to 0, that means, because the line, the area element is positive, that means d1n is equal to d2n. And we read that the normal components of the electric flux density are continuous across an interface. Here's our summary slide. In this presentation, we have focused on the first of a set of applications of the previous material on electrostatics. What did we do? Well, we first applied the knowledge of computing the potential around a small closed loop to show that across an interface, the tangential components of the electric field are continuous. And in going around this loop, we decided to pick a very clever contour where the main sides of the contour were parallel to the interface and there was no contributions from the sides of the contour. Then we went to look at Gauss's law applied to a closed pillbox to find out that across an interface, the normal components of the electric flux density are continuous. To do this calculation, we picked our pillbox to have very small sidewalls, so no flux contributions came from the sides, only from the top and the bottom. Because of that, when we did the dot product, we got the result that the net contribution of the flux was equal to zero since there was no charge contained inside. And therefore, we were able to show algebraically that the normal components of the electric flux density are continuous when we cross the boundary. Finally, the applications of 1 and 2 are examples of finding electromagnetic boundary conditions across an interface. And these conditions have many applications. For example, radio wave propagation, refraction, and reflection.